Recording is now on. Let me uh, let me go ahead and do share my screen to begin with. To uh, I want to go through some slides to kind of set up what we're going to be doing and to frame some of the conversations I want us to have. Get rid of some of these Zoom windows. And I don't even think I'm going to go into present presentation mode because I'm going to be um, starting a stopping screen share. So uh, it's a lot more beneficial to have the conversations when we're not doing screen share. And um, Marie, could you um, monitor the participants window to see if there are any noise issues and so forth and the chat? I'm going to go ahead and mute at all. Okay. So, uh, just to uh, kind of a so uh, you should be good to go. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so just a preview of what we're going to be doing. Uh, I do want to actually take us back to before we had to pivot to remote instruction, just to talk about um, uh, some of the some of the characteristics of how we organize our, our our course. Because I mean, if we're talking about planning for the fall, and with many of us uh, needing to be uh, you know dealing with remote instruction going into the fall. Can, can, um, we'll we'll need to we'll want to have that that baseline of what we're doing this spring. I want to talk about some different kinds of blends of synchronous and asynchronous balance across different course designs. Bring in a little bit of some discussion about seat time and uh, credit requirements. But I do actually want to. We'll actually spend a good. 20, 25 minutes, maybe a little bit more uh, later on in the workshop, actually giving you all time to work through a, a course planning exercise that I've pulled out from um, a source that I'll, I'll talk about later. And then we'll have some time to go into breakout rooms to just talk about plans for the fall uh, and have some wrap up discussion. So just to kind of frame what we're talking about here, um, if we all think back to a lifetime ago now, it seems like, pre-pandemic, most of us uh, at Purchase, we deal with face-to-face -face classes. And of course, the big thing there is when is our class scheduled? Um, um, and, you know, we kind of build our courses around the class times that we've got scheduled with our students. But I guess a couple of points that I want to make here is by definition, those class times are synchronous. Our face-to-face -face class times are synchronous. We've got a scheduled time in place. Everyone attends together. I also want to point out that even though there's some variation in how we structure our face-to-face -face time with our students, Generally speaking, we're talking about these being instructor-led spaces. Uh, and I don't want to, uh, I'll want you to all talk about or to, um, to write about, you know, what you generally do in that space in, in a minute or so. But uh, although there's variation, pretty much unless you really, really decolonize the, your, your class, uh, these are really still kind of instructor-led spaces. It, um, and so, uh, given that, uh, we have this, this Carnegie credit hours situation. So, um, I've got, well, let me just go here. Um, this may be review for many of you, but uh, others of you may have never gotten into the weeds on this. Uh, how do we actually figure out credit hours for our face-to-face -face classes? Uh, I want to go through this because it'll be important for us to keep this in mind as we think about how we might balance asynchronous and synchronous activities in a remote instruction kind of um, situation. So, you know, by definition, one 
credit uh, one semester credit hour is defined for at least lecture sections as one hour of contact per week for the 15 weeks that we meet um, in the fall. Uh, again, this holds true for lecture sections. At a practical matter, one hour generally is like 50 minutes because we've got to have time to get between classes. And so most of our courses are four credit hours. Many of them are set up as two 100 minute classes. So my geology lecture last fall met Tuesday, Thursday from 12.30 to 2.10. 12.30 to 2.10 is 100 minutes. And so, you know, by meeting twice a week with my students um, for the 15 weeks, give or take, of uh, fall semester, uh, that's my four credit um, geology lecture section. Uh, if you meet once a week, theoretically, it should be 200 minute class, although I think there's some, some fudge factor around that. Um, you know, a lot of campuses have Monday, Wednesday, uh, Friday classes and Tuesday, Thursday classes. We have primarily Monday, Thursday and Tuesday, Friday, and then we've got classes that are happening on Wednesday and so forth. Those of you who teach lab and studio courses know that you've got a different calculation. Um, I think generally speaking, we're using like two hours of contact for an hour of, of uh, credit. And so again, the focus for our face-to-face -face classes is generally speaking around this synchronous class time that we are um, meeting. Um, of course, this is not the whole story because we have a, an expectation that students are going to do more than just sit in my sit in our classes for 200 minutes uh, a week in order to get their credit for the class. We have a variety. We expect them to do a variety of things in advance of class to get prepped for the class, and then we expect this pre-class preparation and the activities that we do in class to set students up to do follow-on activities that are perhaps uh, you know, more higher order uh, that require all of the learning that's taking place in the classroom and all the prep that's taking place before that to be able to do the things that they need to do to accomplish the uh, outcomes for our classes. These pre and post class times are generally speaking asynchronous. We don't normally tell our students that, you know, um, on Sunday afternoon before the, uh, my Monday class, I expect you to do X, Y, and Z at this time. So these tend to be self paced activities on the part of our students. Hopefully, our students are doing them. Hopefully, our students have enough agency in. Uh, to to work through this, and we can talk about some of those issues uh, in order to get prep for our classes. Post class activities also, generally speaking, uh, although there may be you know due dates and and deadlines and so forth, uh, all that activity on the part of the students, all those learning activities tend to be asynchronous and self paced. So. Um, you know, this goes back to that Carnegie at credit hour um, issue. One credit hour for, well, my four credit hours for um, my geology class last fall is not only the 200 minutes that we're together in the classroom, but two hours per credit of work outside of class for all of that pre-class preparation, the homework, the projects, the papers, any of that other kind of stuff. Uh, so for lab and studio courses, um, the reason why the contact hours are different is that there's an expectation that there is less of this additional work because we're doing more of the stuff actually in the lab. Although I've taught lab classes in the past, and I certainly expect my students to do stuff to prepare for the classes, those labs, 
and uh, there typically would be follow-up as well. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, what I would like us to do now um, is to actually spend a little bit of time for us uh, to gather some notes about how we would generally have thought about this kind of really basic fundamental face-to-face -face design for some of our classes last spring before we had to pivot to remote. So I've set up, uh, come on, too many Zoom tabs. I've set up a, a, a Google Doc that I'll share the link to in just a minute where um, I want everyone who's on the call this morning to uh, take, you know, five minutes or so to pick one of these rows that no one else is, is working on. And first, spend some time just kind of thinking about one, one of your courses, one of your typical courses from last spring. What are the kinds of things that you would have scheduled for you and for your students to do during that synchronous class time. So I want you, I want you all, once I share this um, document out, I want you all to uh, you know, focus on that synchronous class time first. And then once you've got that pretty well set, uh, come over here to describe the kinds of asynchronous activities that you would have had your students do uh, in advance of getting together in class as that kind of class prep. And then finally, given the class prep that the students have done and the kinds of activities you've, you've done in class, uh, what would that set the students to, up to do as kind of follow up to, your, uh, to the work that you've done with your students in class um, that would allow the students to work on some of those um, some of those things that they would need to do to, to make sure that they can demonstrate the, um, the outcomes for the class. So let me just get this link. And I'm going to um, pop over into the chat. And uh, so you should all be able to click on this link that's in the chat and go to this Google Doc. And I see some of you are coming in already. Anonymous Panda, I think, was in here first. And, um, you know, again, pick one of those rows that no one else is working in. Uh, start with the middle column. Kind of describe the kinds of things that you would have your students do. And then go to the class prep and fill in that and then the follow-up. Well, again, I don't want, I want these uh, sessions today to be kind of more, um, more time for us to be reflective and less time uh, doing a forced march like the Moodle Basics workshop. So we'll take five minutes or so for you all to, uh, you know. Uh, Keith, this might seem like a silly question. But yeah, go ahead, uh, Shaka. Aren't pre-class activities just post-class activities closer to the next class? And I, well, to be, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of... Are you talking about things people do in the... I mean, there certainly is a cycle. If I'm, if I'm meeting twice a week with my geology students, which is actually not the way I structured my class uh, because I kind of combined lecture and, and a lab section in order, to be take, in order to take my students off campus for field trips. But if I were doing just kind of a regular Monday, Thursday um, class, uh, I would have students do some things before the Monday class uh, in order to um, you know, be able to be prepped for uh, what we're gonna be doing in class on Monday. Between Monday and Thursday, I might be having my students do some things in order to prep for my Thursday class. But above and beyond that, you know, eventually all of that stuff is going to lead to student activities that are more than just prepping for the next class, right? And so that's what I really want the third column to be. Uh, and if that's confusing, I mean, we'll focus mostly on the first and second uh, columns anyway, but... Um, 
you know, I don't necessarily have my students do a um, podcast showing that they've understood um, the principles of plate tectonics uh, as a specific prep for an up upcoming class. That's something I might expect them to be able to do once they have done the readings on plate tectonics and after we've had our class sessions um, dealing with, um, you know, that topic. And then, you know, that sets them up to do something that's above and beyond just prepping for class and being in class. That's really kind of what I'm thinking about for that third column. Does that help, Shaka? Um, yeah. Not really. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's fine. It's kind of an artificial thing, but uh, uh, we'll talk about why I'm having you go through this in, in a bit. Okay, cool. And then, um, sorry, this is a, I don't know, sorry, I don't, I want to jump to the end at some point, sooner rather than later, just personally to, I mean, not to slow your roll too much at all, um, but I really want to hear what my colleagues are actually going to do this fall. And I, and the, and yep. this is a super helpful exercise just in the sense of seeing, okay, like, well, a lot of this we could do asynchronously, right? Yeah. Uh, but there's so, more, like super concrete things I can leave with today. The Right. And that's what the whole, um, we'll have an individual activity, we'll have the breakout rooms, and we'll have plenty of time for the breakout rooms discussion. I think we'll actually do longer breakout rooms. Um, today than we did on Tuesday. And then we'll report back. So there'll be plenty of time for actually having conversation with with colleagues. But at, at 27 in the room here, I think we'll do that better once, once uh, we've gone through the individual um, thinking about this and do that conversation in the breakout rooms. I think I lost the page. I don't know what happened to it. Um, lost the page? Yeah, you can type on. Well, if you go back into the chat, you can just click on the link again. It should take you back into the document. Yeah, and as these... Um, as these rows fill up and get longer, the document's going to take more and more um, pages. So um, you should, and there's plenty of room at the bottom of the document if you need a quiet place to, to work. Would it be possible to get a blank um, this questionnaire as an exercise for the students. I like this activity, but I would like the students to be able to do it as well. Yeah, I mean, um, topics. How you can, can we get this. Uh, well, you can see I basically uh, in the TLTC we do a lot of work in Google Docs because it's just so um, easy to do. You know, collaborative uh, activities. Mm -hmm. You could do this kind of thing as a wiki page in your Moodle course, or you could, if you are also in the habit of using Google Docs, you could. I mean, basically, I just have a title here. I and I added a table to this this Google Doc. Put some descriptions across the header, um, and then just set up a whole bunch of table rows. No reason why you couldn't do the same kind of thing for an activity, um, you know, during during your Zoom sessions in the fall. This would be uh, um, clearly if you're doing this during your Zoom sessions, this would be a, a synchronous learning activity that you're having your students do. There's no reason why you couldn't uh, set up this kind of a Google Doc and send out the link um, beforehand to your students, and then it would become an asynchronous one. So I think one of the things I want to try to do is kind of break down this distinction between, oh, am I doing a synchronous class or am I doing an asynchronous class? And, Thank you. Yep. So, I mean, if, you, uh, if you've typed in as much as you want to type in, um, and, and I will you know, 
I'll find it interesting to look at these in more detail later. Uh, and you'll have the link to be able to come back and take a look at these as well. Um, if, if you are, if typed in as much as you want to type in, uh, take some time to scan up and down the document and look in particular at this, uh, what do we do with our students in class column in the center here? And if you were to look over what your faculty colleagues were structuring their face-to-face -face class times around before the pandemic, and were to say, well, here are the top three things that I see listed here. Think about those and then go into the chat and start posting what you think um, would be kind of the, the top three things that we seem to be structuring our pre-COVID face-to-face class times around. So. Oh, sorry, I hear that, Dawn. Um, Yeah, so I mean, I'm starting to see some some um, suggestions showing up in the chat about what are some of the high points of our of our classes, the face to face time of our classes. Um, But certainly, I mean, not all of us spend all of our, t none of us probably spend all of our time in our face-to-face -face classes um, doing lecturing, even though that's kind of the uh, stereotypic view of uh, kind of a traditional face-to-face -face class. But certainly lecturing Presenting information to our students is still an important part of what we're doing in our face-to-face. -face. Um, but uh, a lot of us also will, uh, so for PowerPoint with lecture, we've got uh, lectures, we've got uh, guest lectures, we've got presentations that might be presentations by students that could be presentations by us. We've got uh, lecturing and discussion. We've got other things though. Um, discussions of the readings. We've got maybe small group discussions. Maybe we've got full, you know, whole class discussions. Variety of, of activities. So keep that in mind as we think about some of these other models. Um, In terms of prepping, we have, um, you know, a lot of readings, watching films, reading, prepping a conversation guide. We've got, uh, you know, asynchronous class lectures ahead of time. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, doing assigned readings, doing um, uh, grammar exercises, you know, all of these kinds of pre-class homework watching films, answering questions that uh, will get students set up to do the activities, either you know, having more presentation and material or discussions and so forth uh, in class. Um, I mean, the reason why um, I've gone through that is just to point out that you know, in our face-to-face -face classes, we're already having a balance of synchronous and asynchronous learning activities. And we have to decide, you know, if and when we ever get back to a normal life when we're having our kind of traditional face-to-face -face classes again, we've got synchronous activities that are going on in our class. We've got asynchronous learning activities ahead of time. And um, we already are, are, are thinking about what's the balance between those. So just to kind of re re yeah, reinforce this, we've got this kind of a model 
um, for January and February before COVID hit. How many of you um, responded to the pandemic and the closure of campus by basically doing this? So here is the situation before we left campus, and here is the situation after we left campus. I mean, for many of us, I, I won't bother, you know, stopping the share of the screen and have you raise your question, uh, raise your hand. But for many of us, the way we we adapted to having to take our classes remotely in the one week or so that we really had noticed to do this is, okay, this is what I was doing before. I was meeting with my students. I was having them prep for that meeting. I was having them do things in response to that. And now I'm meeting with my students in Zoom. Um, and I'm still having students do uh, stuff to prep for that, and I am um, having them then do things uh, for the class, like uh, you know, do final papers, projects, and, and so forth. This is a very natural way for us to pivot to remote instruction. Um, campus ramped up quite quickly for the Zoom licenses for faculty. And there was a, you know, a frantic, um, how do I get comfortable holding my class in Zoom kind of uh, situation in the spring, which we did a, a number of workshops for. Um, for that, um, I'm going to stop sharing screen and um, either in the chat or maybe if people want to raise their hands. Um, and or just unmute themselves what about that worked well what about you what what aspects of switching your classes to zoom when we had to leave campus this last spring worked well any putting in the chat so people okay. can see this but um i used um i used discord in one of my classes i taught uh Two and a half in the spring. So I taught um, two courses that were, what, what is it, you know, like three and a half, three hours, 40 minutes long. And then one of my courses is an hour and a, was like an hour and a half or so. Um, and um, so for one of my courses, which was one of the longer ones, we use Discord. If people aren't familiar with it, it's essentially a Slack alternative. Um, Moodle does have something similar to it, like it what would be typically called a, um, what would you call that? It's a, it's a chat room, or yes. but it's more than that. It's not just a single chat. You do it, you know, like Slack, it's broken into conversation topics, or you, which you can invent. Um, what worked? Oh, someone asked, what is A-B testing? A-B testing, sorry, is a programmer term. It means you have multiple versions. You do, you do two, um, you do A, you, option A and option B. So in one of my classes, I use Discord. In one of my classes, I did not use Discord. So I can see a, a distinct difference, right? Yes. So what it what it what it allowed to happen was that um, students would just have these constant conversations with each other. This is what I'm looking for, right? They they're missing this opportunity by us being online. They're not going to have these classroom conversations to get to know each other nearly as much, nor as easy for them to kind of bump into someone they don't know that well and be like, "Hey, I actually didn't understand what Lee was saying on blah 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 yeah. blah," you know. And it really helped foster that. Um, right. But Discord is one of these places where people are like constantly like question answer question answer yeah. i'm thinking this boom here's a here's a meme youtube flag, x what um and i could be really involved with that by like kind of jumping in and being like hey everyone oh i see your few of you are asking questions on this here's a link to find out more or oh actually yeah let me just clarify that so i could be doing that intensely because they're doing it intensely i'm i'm like matching their energy and excitement but that that's a lot of them um that's a lot of investment of time and like emotional and energy, but there's also, there are ways where you can just be like, hey, this is a resource for you, I'm not gonna be involved. I think that's possible, but then again, I don't know if the students will build the right. community or not, and it's hard for me to say. So uh, what I hear you saying, Lee, is that, um, uh, that actually kind of, to me, focuses on some limitations of just relying on a Zoom session. You, you, you're missing some of that uh, kind of back and forth that you would have in a face-to-face -face class, and you were able to bring in another tool to kind of overcome that. Sometimes you're using that synchronously. Maybe you kept using that asynchronously. I, I think 
uh, for a lot of us and for a lot of our students, um, having the Zoom rooms available, continuing that synchronous time provided a number of benefits. So I want to focus on that first. I mean, what, what, do, what do you see as the, the benefits that the students got out of having the ability for you and your students to show up in Zoom at the regularly scheduled class time? Uh, some of the things we talked about on Tuesday, you know, there is this sense of continuity that, you know, students um, had gone to all sorts of different situations. The fact that we were still having an opportunity to meet together once or twice a week in our Zoom sessions kind of kept that, that yeah, students maybe felt alone, they were dealing with things. I, I know a, a number of faculty on Tuesday talked about, well, we, we, we talked about more than just the class when we got together in Zoom. We, we talked about some of these situations that the students were dealing with. So I guess the point I want to make is that, that this, this pivot to, and let me share my screen again, this pivot to using a Zoom classroom replacement for our face-to-face -face classroom had a number of advantages in terms of maintaining some sense of community among our students, uh, some sense of structure for the class. Uh, these were face-to-face -face classes where students aren't necessarily coming into the classroom with uh, a focus on being self-directed and having agency to work through a whole bunch of just asynchronous learning activities that that were thrown at them. So having the Zoom classroom, you know, really uh, maintained that sense of community and allowed faculty to deal with uh, some of the issues um, outside of class issues that students were dealing with. Uh, we we'll do want to point out, though, that um, there were a number of downsides for our students and for our faculty with this heavy switch to, to using Zoom. Um, and actually, let me just pop down to this figure here uh, to illustrate some of this. Um, this is a diagram showing uh, a couple of axes here of uh, different kinds of online activities on the basis of whether they require high bandwidth, um, both uh, technologically and mentally on the part of students and versus low bandwidth versus activities that are low latency versus high latency. And I will just point out that uh, our Zoom sessions are essentially in the upper right hand corner of this red quadrant. They are very high immediacy kind of uh, uh, activities in that we're having everyone show up at the same time during the Zoom session. We can spend some time face to face. We can do you know uh, high contact activities. These are also very high bandwidth. Um, um, Zoom is is a high bandwidth kind of approach to remote instruction. We had a no, we had a lot of students who had difficulty just technologically dealing with um, all of the Zoom sessions that they were expected to attend. Many of them went home to uh, environments where there might be you know, one computer, limited bandwidth, other, uh, other um, siblings in the household needing to use uh, that, that computer and bandwidth, maybe parents who are working online. And so we did have a number of students who had difficulty just, just being present in the Zoom sessions. Um, I guess I won't take the time to go through this, but let me, and I'll send this around to you later. Um, but this, this figure is from a nice um, um, blog post that came out um, uh, uh, back in, in March, talking about alternatives to, you know, this high intensity video conferencing approach. Uh, looking at some, some different low bandwidth teaching approaches setting up this uh, bandwidth versus immediacy um, quadrant 
and then just kind of working through what some of these different tools are. So, you know, down here in the green zone, um, low immediacy in that we're not doing, you know, face-to-face -face kind of activities, but also low bandwidth. And low bandwidth also means, low bandwidth and low immediacy also means flexibility. And so, um, part of what we're going to be talking about in balancing synchronous and asynchronous in your planning for fall is how to how to provide a, a set of flexible learning activities for your students maybe through increased use of um, asynchronous learning activities while still maintaining a, a, a sufficient amount of high immediacy activities so that your students feel engaged, that they feel part of a learning community. It's going to be a balance of these different quadrats. So, you know, down here in the green, there are discussion forums like in Moodle or email or po posting readings in Moodle. Um, and, you know, one of the things we've added to Moodle is a social annotation platform so that as you put your readings into Moodle, you can actually set it up so your, your students collaborate on marking up and commenting on those readings. So that's the green zone, the blue zone. Um, these are uh, kinds of activities that provide a sense of immediacy but are a little bit easier to handle um, in terms of bandwidth. So collaborative documents and group chat and messaging. The Discord could be done in a way that doesn't take a lot of, of uh, bandwidth, but provides uh, that sense of community. We, I had you spend some time earlier, you know, do, working on a shared Google Doc. We're actually doing that during our live Zoom session here. But again, you could set up these collaborative documents uh, to be done uh, outside of a Zoom session. Still. Uh, synchronous so you could just tell everyone uh, we're not going to we're not going to bring up zoom today or we're not going to spend all of our time in zoom today but I want everyone to go into the Google Doc during our regular class time uh, we'll use the commenting feature to talk about what we're doing and we'll spend some time collaborating on whatever the project is um, this yellow zone would be things like um, um, audio and video on demand. So, uh, you know, recording your lectures, posting them on your, your YouTube channel, popping them into Moodle. Uh, students still need a certain amount of bandwidth to be able to watch those or, or voice threads or, you know, things like that provide, uh, you know, you're not requiring everyone to be there at the same time so there's a little bit more flexibility they can be a little bit more demanding in terms of technology bandwidth in terms of you know what um, you know viewing a voice thread or viewing a uh, recorded lecture and then of course we've already talked about you know up here in the red zone um, primarily we're talking about you know Zoom because that's what our campus pivoted to. Other campuses pivoted to, you know, Microsoft Teams or or uh, um, Blackboard Collaborate or things like that, uh, where you've got everyone in at the same time, um, high immediacy but also high bandwidth. So, uh, again, I'll send that link around as well as a, a link to um, some related materials. But as we're thinking about uh, synchronous versus asynchronous, um, you know, we'll want to keep the these ver uh, various tools in mind and how to come up with the best balance for, for our particular courses. Just, I want to kind of maybe skim through some of these others to in order to get into the real meat of the session today. Um, as you're thinking about your blend across uh, synchronous and asynchronous times, think about where is information transfer happening. You know. So for those of us who are lecturing during our face-to-face -face time, obviously that lecturing is information transfer, but also the readings that we have students do ahead of time. Or if we pre-record a voice thread or YouTube lecture, that's also information that can be done asynchronously. So where across the synchronous, asynchronous 
balance are because all of our classes have to have at least some amount of here is the content that my students have to to learn they have to engage with it they have to experience so there's that information transfer but then there's also students constructing meaning around the materials you know building it into their cognitive frameworks where is that taking place across this balance of synchronous and asynchronous um, activities and for many of our classes there are various skill development um, outcomes where uh, certainly in the conservatories uh, but also in LAS you know there's a lot of um, communication skills, uh, critical thinking skills, other kinds of skills that we want our students to develop that go beyond just learning some content and making sense of it. And when, where are those spread out across these synchronous and asynchronous activities? So um, just there are some variations on this. Um, standard kind of uh, view of face-to-face -face instruction that I think might be useful for uh, you all to think about, for us all to think about as we're planning our fall courses. Um, one would be doing a kind of a flipped classroom approach where we're still talking about having a synchronous meeting time, whether that's in our classroom on campus or in our Zoom room with uh, asynchronous uh, activities around it, but um, with the idea that we we're not taking all of our class time just to do information transfer. We're offloading that as much as possible to the uh, asynchronous activities ahead of time. And that frees up our time together to uh, do things that are go beyond just information transfer. And if we, if you look through that Google Doc that people worked in, uh, this is already, whether people are talking about doing flipped classroom or not, many of us are already doing this. We're, we're presenting material ahead of time. We're not, we're doing more than just lecturing in class. We're doing projects. We're having applications. Um, you know, maybe we're having students read about, um, you know, doing uh, some kind of statistical analysis in the readings and, and pre-class lectures. And then in class, we're spending time actually facilitating students working through problem sets and dealing with the problems that, they, that they're dealing with. So most of us do some level of flipped classroom um, you know, in, in, if we're talking about the traditional classroom being lecture and then there's stuff that students do outside of class versus presenting content to the students at a time and focusing on class activities. So there's, there's flipped classroom. Many of us may want to think for the fall and of going maybe just even beyond flipped classroom a little bit to uh, think about adopting to some extent a blended hybrid model. So if you look here, um, this kind of uh, formulation of our regular classroom, whether it is traditional lecture or flipped, with uh, a blended model, we're talking about actually trading off some of that synchronous time uh, maybe not meeting twice a week, but maybe taking one of the uh, weekly class sessions and replacing that with a variety of asynchronous learning activities. Uh, and then the question becomes, I mean, whether we're talking about keeping our class schedule as it is or thinking about throwing in some amount of additional asynchronous activities, the question really boils down to, Class time is, is, a, is a valuable, critical resource. There's only a certain amount of time. Uh, so then the question becomes, what is the most important thing for us to do during our time together with our students, whether they're face-to-face -face or, uh, or online in Zoom? And so part of the exercise today is going to be to have you all think about um, 
the kinds of learning activities students need to do. And I'm going to want you to think about what are those, which of those are the most important for you to actually focus your or class time on and which uh, can be th I don't, offloaded, let's just say offloaded to asynchronous learning activities. This becomes very important, I think, for many of us whose regular class time is one four hour block. Okay, I don't, I, uh, I've been in some four hour Zoom meetings and, um, you know, it's very difficult to um, really maintain an engagement over the, over the course of that. And I know a number of faculty had to deal with that this last spring. My class time meets once a week for essentially four hours. It, it's really uh, deadly for you and your students to have to think, oh, I've got to do that as four hours of synchronous activities in Zoom. So mixing that up, maybe taking a break, um, starting your class in Zoom, doing 20 minutes of introduction, and then saying, okay, uh, everyone, we're, we're going to get out of Zoom. I'm going to have you go off and do these things, and then we'll come back, in, you know, in, in 45 minutes, and we'll discuss what you were working on, and then maybe we'll take another break to have you do other things. That, you're still basically using that four-hour time block, but rather than requiring everyone to be in a continuous uh, synchronous session, you have some ability to break it up. So again, think about the, the mix of, of these things. Um, and then there are fully online courses. I just want to make the point that, I mean, this is all a continuum. This, it's our traditional lecture courses. There are blend, uh, flipped courses. There are blended courses. There are fully online courses. We've got this, this whole mix. Um, to set up the uh, activity I want us to spend a fair amount of time working on, th probably University of Central Florida is, is probably the, the, one of the national leaders in developing programming for faculty to really think about this blended learning or, or this is also obviously uh, applicable to flip classroom or flip remote or blended remote kind of class course designs, but they have this um, openly licensed blend kit course that really does a good job of taking faculty through uh, an analysis of what they want to do with their course and, and uh, coming up with the appropriate a set of learning activities that take place during whatever synchronous time you've got together and then what you want to do outside of that synchronous time. Now this is a six-week course that if faculty are interested in going through, I can certainly facilitate that here, but we're not going to do this in a, we're not going to do a six-week course in the course of a two-hour workshop this morning. So what I've done is I've pulled out one particular activity from this sequence that I think works fairly well as a standalone activity and really sets up well the um, kind of thinking that you might want to do when you apply to your course design for the fall. Um, so in a minute, I'm going to give you a link to uh, that document in the chat so you can all download a copy of this Word doc. And then I want you know, to spend 15, 20 minutes just kind of going through that. Let me uh, just show you what that Word doc um, is about. This basically encapsulates the whole backwards course design process into a single uh, um, worksheet uh, activity. And so um, this backwards course design uh, basically um, starts off with, well, what are the outcomes that you want your students to accomplish? And um, for this activity, I just want you to select one little chunk of your course, whether it is a specific topic or, you know, something that you have your students do in, that is the focus for, let's say, week four of your class. However you 
break your class up into manageable chunks. Pick one of those and just, um, in this document, talk about what do you actually want your students to accomplish when they are uh, working on, in, with you in that chunk of the course. So it's always best to start with, what do I want my students to be able to do? What do I want them to accomplish in the course as a whole and in this particular uh, piece of the course? Then, you know, what activities do the students actually have to do during that piece of the course to accomplish those objectives? Um, and then, only then, once you know what you want your students to actually do in order to uh, accomplish the outcomes of that piece of the course, then it's a good idea to think about, well, okay, what materials do they actually need to have in order to work on that? You know, am I going to give them uh, lecture notes? Am I going to give them a, a voice thread lecture? Am I going to point them to textbook and so forth? What kinds of interactions? How will the students be interacting with the course content? How, how do they need to interact with me? How do they need to interact with each other uh, in order to accomplish those, out, uh, those activities? And then, even though instructional technology is, you know, what we help faculty with a lot, those tools should always come last. It's not, I've got this tool, how can I use it in my class? It's, what do I want my students to accomplish in my class? And then, what tool is best to do that? So, um, with that kind of an introduction, let me just copy this a link into the chat. And um, make sure it goes to everybody and not just, I, I hate when Zoom surreptitiously directs my chat to one individual privately when I don't notice it. So everyone should be able to go in the chat, click on that link. And again, uh, let's spend about 15 minutes or so having everyone think about some piece of one of the classes that they are planning for the fall. Make sure you can download that document and start entering in some of those uh, pieces. What do I want my students to accomplish? What do they need to do? What are the activities that I want them to participate in to accomplish those outcomes? What are the resources, interactions, and tools? And then, um, will uh, once you've all had a chance to fill that document out to some extent then you know as Shaka said I think the most valuable part of this is going to be the time we can spend talking with each other about what we're planning to do for our fall courses so we'll use the breakout feature of zoom to do some small group discussions around this first and then we'll bring it back to the the full class <laughs> the full zoom session discussion um, so, um, it's not quite 11, um, everyone please download that document. We'll go to about, um, a quarter after 11. I'll see how people are doing and then we'll set up the breakout room discussions. And if anyone's having trouble downloading the document or if you've downloaded the document, one issue that uh, one or two faculty members had on Tuesday was they downloaded the document, but then they weren't able to do any editing in it. Uh, you might, depending on how Word is set up on your computer, you might have to say enable editing. Um, but um, yeah, so it doesn't matter what, I mean, if you want to pull it up into uh, you know some other tool. Um, yeah, so again, um, I'm going to stop babbling for a little bit. And I'll pause the recording. Thanks for.